Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to JFree906 and the Curse of Oak Island and Beyond live stream. And we have a fantastic show for you here today. Um, we have uh, Luca Santoni, film uh, filmmaker and director for Web Icon. And he has, if you haven't already seen it, um, he has a five part series, TV series that he has created uh, for what, what is called Templars. Uh, three uh, episodes are out already. They are available on uh, Amazon. And we are about to, uh, we're, well, we're going to be talking about episode number four today. Um, and I tell you, we've had uh, Luca and part of his team was on uh, when they were talking about episode number three. Um, and that was on just a little while ago, but it is available out on uh, Amazon. And now we are, I think the 26th, this is the date that is uh, next Thursday, they are releasing uh, episode number four. And episode number four is about Gudrid the Fair. Now, I love this because it is giving me an opportunity to learn about someone who I had no idea even existed. This is a, a extraordinary woman uh, that you're going to hear some more about today. We have uh, the authors that have written books and all are part of this upcoming episode. You're going to have a lot of fun with this today. You're going to get to meet these authors and hear what they have to say about Goodred uh, and also the Zeno brothers and things that are going on over in that area of the country or the world uh, back in that time. So uh, we're going to get started with this in just a second. Uh, I'm going to run this little video here. And then as soon as it is done, we're going to get started. All right. So we'll be right back right after this. Everyone involved the Oak Island universe is that type of person you guys i can tell you're that type of person. you hear a story like this you latch onto it like a dog and you're just like let's go and yes it's frustrating and yes it, it you want it to be solved tomorrow and yes who doesn't want to find a chest of gold of course we do of course everyone does but it doesn't work like that sometimes these things are hard and so it's taking what it's taking and that is in this case 10 years right yeah does it, how does it affect us in 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 changing of the history or getting down to the nitty gritty of the history. It won't, it won't change history. It will explain. There you go. Perfect. History. Thank you. Thank you. That's what I was um, It will explain parts of North American history you've never thought about. See, I can't. The, the, the History Channel could not have come up with a better teaser than we just did right here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I tell you what, stay tuned, folks, <laughs> yeah. because this is going to be a good one. I can't wait. It really this is Robert Clotworthy the narrator of The Curse of Oak Island. And I have a question for you. Could it be that you are listening to The Curse of Oak Island and Beyond live stream? This is a top pocket find, mate, for sure. All right. So I'm, <laughs> I actually clicked on the wrong video there, but that's all right. It's still, uh, we got that going. And I'm going to bring up first Mr. Luca Santoni. Uh, Luca, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the Templar series. Uh, this is a very informative uh, and wonderful, and the uh, video work that has been done, the cinematography is fantastic with your son doing much of it. We're going to bring him on here in a minute too, but thank you so much, sir, for that and for coming on the show today. Thank you, and uh, hi to everyone. And uh, this is uh, the occasion to um, let you know that... Uh, on Thursday next week, uh, the episode uh, four will be released in Amazon Prime Video, USA and UK. So uh, this is a special episode because it's still uh, inside the Templar um, story, but uh, in a totally different way. Mm -hmm. We're gonna go earlier in time when the Vikings uh, open the roads, the sea road, like uh, Margaret uh, Elphiston would say in her book, uh, to um, America, to North America. So um, what um, Jeff has done today is to 
uh, group uh, the authors that uh, have spoken about Gudrid in the years and uh, there will be almost all of them uh, unfortunately uh, Margaret will be not uh, here with us today but uh, the other two are uh, Nancy Mary Brown and uh, Heather De Gilbert so um, also there will be Andrea de Robilan uh, who is going to speak about uh, the uh, Zeno brothers uh, already he did it last time when he was in the show and he will start from there because uh, he will be also in these episodes yeah, fantastic. And so, you know, this is something, like I said, you've brought this group of people. How you found them, Luca, I really, I, I, I don't know, but I'm so glad that you did. Because each one of these authors uh, have brought something interesting to this story. And I, I cannot wait to watch this partic particular episode. As I said before, this is showing me about something, a person that I never knew existed. And uh, I, it's really going to be uh, very interesting. I think, uh, did we want to start off with Andrea? And we're going to kind of go around the around the, uh, the the screen here a little bit, folks, and uh, let you hear a little bit from each one of them. And then we'll get into a little bit more about um, uh, Goodrid the Fair as we go along. Are we ready for that, Luca? Yes. Um, Andrea de Robilan uh, wrote the book... Um... Um, Irresistible North that is uh, still available in the United States. Not many copies, but it's still, it's still possible to find it. And um, Nancy Mary Brown, uh, we don't see her in the picture right now, but uh, she's connected with us. She have her on the phone. Us. <laughs> yeah, she hears us and uh, she will speak to. Uh, was the very first uh, author that I contacted uh, because of Goodread. And uh, then I went through the book of Margaret Elphiston, uh, mm -hmm. the Scottish author, and uh, uh, Adder de Gilbert, uh, who, uh, who is uh, uh, here with us, um, and uh, she will speak about that too. Then there is, uh, of course, um, Gretchen, because Gretchen is a, a great part uh, in the last uh, two episodes. Uh, she wrote the text of them, and uh, she is a really important collaborator in the series. And um, Tania Martino from Italy has been the main character of episode one and two. Mm -hmm. And Very good uh, job. yeah, they they joined together in the last uh, episode of the series, uh, episode five, uh, season final. And uh, it's going to be uh, released around July this year. And uh, my son, Paolo Emilio, instead uh, is the guy who did all the filming uh, from the air with the drones. Without him, it wouldn't be possible to have uh, the spectacular images that we have seen so far. Yeah, they're very well done, too, by the way. So <laughs> thank you. The cinematography is fantastic in these episodes. Yeah, very, very well done. Okay, so do we want to turn it over right now to Andrea? Okay, well, uh, thanks a lot for having me and, and uh, hello to everybody. Uh, just briefly to tell you who I am. I'm Andrea Di Robilant. I, I, I'm a, a journalist and, and writer, a historian. Um, I teach at American University here in Rome, Italy, where I live. And I teach mostly uh, journalism and creative writing. And the reason I'm here today to talk to you is because a few years ago, I, I wrote a book called, as Luca said, Irresistible North, which is this book here. And it was published by uh, Knopf um, a few years ago. And basically, it tells the story. It's a very controversial story of two uh, Venetian brothers who, back in the 14th century, uh, were shipwrecked in, uh, in the Channel uh, and uh, eventually in the North Sea. And um, uh, traveled uh, over the course of a decade uh, to 
along the Scandinavian coast and to the Faroe Islands and Iceland and, and Greenland and possibly the coast of North America and came back with um, an extraordinary tale and, and fairly detailed maps uh, of an area that was not known at all back in Europe in those uh, years. We're talking about the 1380s, 1390s. Now, of course, uh, the Vikings had been sailing along that route for uh, many years, um, but, uh, but their, their travels and the, and the sort of Norse culture in that part of the world was, was, was not known in, uh, in Europe. So, so the tales that the Venetian brothers brought back to, uh, to Europe were very important. Um, I will just mention one aspect to, to give you a sense of how important they were. Uh, when the British decided that it was time to build their empire overseas, they had no maps, no way of getting over there. And they used the, the, te the, the histories and the letters and the text of the, of the Zeno brothers, Niccolò and Antonio Zeno, uh, to make their way to, to North America. And they most certainly used their maps um, to, to get over. It is quite an extraordinary tale, this, um, and, and it's very little known. But when Queen Elizabeth, on the advice of her advisor, John Dee, uh, uh, asked uh, the famous navigator Martin Frobisher to lead an expedition to, um, to North America, Frobisher left London with the text of the Zeno brothers and the map drawn by the Zeno brothers uh, in order to get over that. And the logs of that trip are extraordinary in that they tell us uh, to, to what degree Frobisher followed the instructions and the maps of the Zeno brother, brothers to, to get over. So this is just to say that the Zeno brother narrative uh, had a huge impact in uh, in in the birth of the uh, of the British Empire in uh, in in North America, uh, and of course the the, tale, the the story of the Zeno brothers was was later denounced in the 19th century uh, as, as a hoax, uh, and the story became very controversial, and so on. I won't go into the details right now. Um, but my book is really an attempt to rescue this story uh, from uh, uh, from all the accusations that have been that had been um, uh, made against it, uh, and to restore it to its its proper place. In other words, I do think that it is in, 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 impossible to explain the um, the expansion of uh, of Great Britain into North America without the Zeno narrative. And one last thing I will say, the influence of the Zeno brothers in uh, the northward thrust of the, of the British Empire was really unknown until 1976, when uh, the, the original letters by John Dee, the advisor to Queen Elizabeth, in which he mapped out the rationale, philosophical, historical, political, why the, the, the British should lead an expedition to North America. Those, those um, letters were of crucial importance and they had been lost. Uh, and in those letters, it is, it is patent, it is clear that John Dee draws all of his information about uh, the lands overseas from the Zeno brothers. So the link is very, very powerful indeed. And that's probably the most important aspect of, uh, of my book uh, in establishing this uh, link. And I'll leave it uh, uh, to that for the moment, and then we can maybe uh, come back to it later on. All right. 
That, that's fantastic. And, you know, like you said, if it wasn't for the Zeno brothers and their information, um, they, they needed to have that, uh, the maps, they had no maps, so they needed that information. And that's a in, very interesting and ties us all together quite, quite well, actually. So, <laughs> all right. And I think that, uh, Gretchen, I think you had something you wanted to add also with this, uh, on the, with the Zeno brothers as well. Did you uh, not? Well, th thank you. Um, uh, firstly, Andrea, uh, the book is fantastic. Uh, I've, I've got a copy. Uh, it's on amazon.com and it is, uh, last I checked, it's, it's very available. Um, I, uh, have always been a proponent of, of, of looking at the spaces in between history modules. So it's it's um, hu human history rolls like like and falls like dominoes. It doesn't cease at 1066, the last great Viking raid, when William the Conqueror took the throne of England. It, there's follow through with all of these people and connections. So uh, I did want to to help knit uh, what what Andrea has has written about with. Gudrid's people, and uh, to 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 help frame in broad terms how that would look. So I'm not sure if right now is an appropriate time to do that, or um, shall I keep shall I keep waffling, Jeff? <laughs> no, if you want to if you want to go down there, please. You know, okay. To, well, okay, give you us know, that basically, there. Yeah. It's uh, basically it's um, you know if you if you just look at the time scale themselves. Uh, approximately, you know, um, I'm not the expert on, on, on Gudrid that these other authors are, and it's, you know, it's an honor to meet Gudrid and, um, Heather and, and, uh, Nancy, thank you for, for being here and, and Luca for helping put this amazing story together. And this is a woman that, that lived a thousand years ago. That's, you know, incredible, but the time frame is really interesting she uh, approximately was was active in in 1020 um give or take and 100 years later you have the formation of the knights templar uh in 1119 which is how the accepted date in the in western europe etc so that's only four generations it's only a hundred years um <clears throat> Prior to that, uh, uh, you also have to understand that the Vikings, Gudrid's people, were were sailing as far into Istanbul. They became the honor guard of of the emperor in Istanbul. Um, now uh, had been Constantinople, and there's a, a railing where you know these mercenary honor guards are are you know protecting the the emperor at uh, church and basically it's kind of like sven was here because he was bored you know through through this service but um uh the the they traveled far and wide all the way across europe and deep inland along all the river arteries the seas those were the highways that's that's how things got done land was dangerous it was difficult you could be robbed uh, and it was safer on the water. So, so Rollo, of course, um, is one of these Viking chieftains who actually terrorizes and raids the city of Paris. And to prevent him from doing so again, basically negotiations uh, under under went underway. Um, the king of Paris married his daughter to Rollo and made him a duke and gave the Norsemen Normandy to guard the mouth of the river Seine from his uh, countrymen, basically his, his tribe, other Vikings. So that's how we ended up with, with Rollo uh, becoming royalized and all that technology, all that information, all that, you know, warrior culture went right into the French uh, uh, crown. And, uh, you know, fast forward, we've got we've got Gudrid, who's a noble woman. Um, 
very interesting individual. I would say she definitely has what I would call a scholar's heart in that she's uh, she's not out there killing people, raiding and pillaging, etc. <clears throat> and the other authors will have a chance to speak about this. But she is of her people. She is uh, a, a diplomat. She wants to find out, trade and embrace other peoples. Uh, <clears throat> the Scandinavian countries are 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 harsh. Uh, the uh, peoples there had to find other places to live, but they took their their technology with them. So what I'm trying to build a case is for uh, the Vikings all the way into into the heartland and, and nobility and royalty of of uh, the French uh, royal family. We have also one of the original Knights Templar is uh, from uh, the north uh, part of uh, Germany that is right across, uh, it's, it's due east from Denmark and uh, right on the coastline of, uh, believe it or not, a place I've just, uh, just found uh, spelled Graal, G-R-A-A-L. So you've got an original Templar with that DNA, you know, right next to these Scandinavian waters. Um, and all of that technology goes right into the Templar Knights. Just briefly, uh, just to, to, to uh, show how technology can be passed down, a piece of Icelandic uh, spar um, quartz Optical calcite was found on a sunken Elizabethan ship off the coast of France not too long ago. And until then, and this is found in a navigation box um, of the, the, the captain's uh, navigation uh, equipment. So you've got this uh, optical calcite that was used by the Vikings called a sunstone. And it was written down with such prowess, mystic, mysticism, spirituality, that academics actually didn't believe that it was a real object because it had such magical powers. But it allows you to see the sun on a cloudy day. So you are not going to get lost. So that's an Elizabethan worship that this object was found on in recent years. So there's a direct line of secret information that goes all the way down. And one of the main resources in North America is, of course, right, right by Gold Island is Gold River, uh, where they panned for gold, but also uh, timber. Um, game was plentiful. Um, by the time uh, 600 AD rolled around, the French, uh, the kingdoms, had, had obliterated their bears. So there you have in North America rich resources that could be brought over. There was no competition by other Europeans for these resources. So yes, the, the, I believe the Templars inherited uh, the technology, the navigation capacity, the direct information, uh, went right into the original top brass of, of, of their order. So I hope that that brief overview can help you see the progression from Gudrid's time, and she was amongst one of the original travelers there. And of course she would have talked about it. All of these individuals who went on these journeys spoke about it and passed that down. So I hope that you can see that transmission from 1020 to uh, 1120 when the Templars were formalized. So. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for that. And I did want to mention also, I see that you have your books behind you. Um, you have written quite a few books as, um, you know, and Andrea has as well. <laughs> and um, so I, I wanted to make sure that everyone knows in the description below of the uh, of the YouTube channel here, in the description below, I have a link to each one of these authors uh, uh websites uh, where you can find out more information about the books that they have written. Um, and so uh, that's that's a great resource. If any of you want to check those out, please do so. And like I said, the links are there. All you have to do is click on them and you can go 
and uh, find out more information about their particular area of studies. Uh, so thank, thank you very much. And, and Gretchen, I know we've had you on the show uh, before many times, and it's uh, always wonderful to have you come on and explain these kind of things like this. You're tying this all together, and that's fantastic. I appreciate it so very much. Um, thank you. So we'll go, I guess, uh, when we have one of our guests that's uh, uh, unfortunately uh, had a little bit of trouble with the Internet today. So uh, we have... Um, uh, Nancy on the phone with us, um, uh, and I will bring her picture up next, and uh, hopefully you can hear her okay. Are you, are you still there, Nancy? Can you hear us? I'm still here. Thanks, Jeff. All right. All right. I'm going to uh, show, uh, bring up your picture here so that everyone can see it, and then please uh, go ahead and, uh, if you would, and share with us a little bit about um, your particular portion of this expertise, and oh, I got to hold on just a moment. I got to Share. Here we go. All right. There we go. All right. Now we have your picture up and we can see you. <laughs> well, I live in northern Vermont and up here, the uh, the weather decides whether or not I have internet. <laughs> yeah. So it's just decided today was not going to be one of those mm. days. So I'm uh, I'm on a landline, actually, which is uh, really old technology for the kinds of things we're talking about. But I'm a, a full-time author. I, I uh, specialize in the Middle Ages and the Viking period, and I've written two books about Gudrid the Far Traveler um, called Gudrid the Fair in this film. Uh, the first book is called The Far Traveler, Voyages of a Viking Woman, and it came out in 2007. This is a nonfiction uh, book of history, and it tells the story of the Viking settlement in Greenland and the Viking explorations in the New World from Gudrid's point of view. The second book I wrote is The Saga of Gudrid's Far Traveler, and that's a historical novel for young adults. It came out eight years after The Far Traveler um, because uh, Gudrid wasn't finished with me yet, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. My main source for both of these books are the medieval Icelandic sagas that tell about Gudrid. This is the saga of Eric the Red and the saga of the Greenlanders, and together they're usually published as the Vinland sagas. Now, one thing you have to know about the Icelandic sagas is that they were written down at least 200 years after Gudrid's time. Wow. So it's not surprising that it's not quite the story she would have told and leaves out a lot of things that we would like to know. One of the things that's different in these sagas is that she is never called the Far Traveler. She was given this nickname by modern scholars because she was the most well-traveled woman of her time. And there are several male characters in different sagas who get this nickname, the Far Traveler. And they didn't travel nearly as far as she did. So I've come to know her as Gudrid the Far Traveler. Mm, interesting. And these two books um, together... My, my purpose for these books was to really change the meaning of the word Viking. You know, when you think of you know, Viking TV series or all the popular, you know, media that we know about Vikings, you're, you're faced with these bloodthirsty berserk mm -hmm. warriors, and yep. we know that they terrorized the monks at Lindisfarne in 793, and they sacked Paris, as Gretchen was telling us, and they also sacked London and Hamburg and Seville, and there's this little Mediterranean port town called Luna in Italy, which they thought was Rome. They were really happy that they had sacked Rome, but actually they sacked Luna. <laughs> um, now, some people do think of Leif Erikson as the classic Viking. Ah, yes. And he discovered America somewhere around the year 1000. But my question was, why does Leif get all the credit? Because after his first winter in the New World, he never went back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Goodred was Leif's sister-in-law. Wow. And she tried to settle in North America twice with two different husbands. She did get there with the second one. Uh, they had a, uh, an expedition of three ships with two of them crewed by Icelanders and one crewed by Greenlanders. And Goodred actually owned that third ship herself. And they stayed for three years Um going at least around in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and who knows how much farther south. So to me, Gudrid is the real explorer. She lived in Iceland, where she was born. Uh, she got married in Greenland. She explored North America. 
she traveled from there back to Norway. And then as an old woman, after living several years in Iceland again, she took a pilgrimage to Rome. So altogether, Gudrid crossed the North Atlantic Ocean in an open boat wow. eight times. Wow. Now, I can't actually believe anybody could be that courageous who just wants to, you know, travel across the Atlantic that many times. Mm -hmm. And certainly not me, because I get seasick. So when I was trying to recreate her voyages in my head, I spent a lot of time in the library. Um, I calculated once that I read 350 books and journal articles about wow. Gudrid. So she's not the something somebody that nobody knows about mm -hmm. and i also visited the places that she lived and interviewed the archaeologists and the historians who have been working there uh studying the viking age in denmark norway iceland greenland and canada and through them i learned some of the things that the sagas leave out i learned how to make and sail a viking ship how to build a long house out of turf how to weave a cloak or a sail out of wool, and both of those tasks were done by women, what the Vikings ate, how their language affected ours, the status of women in the society, and how Christianity slowly changed their world. And I'd have to say that the most ex amazing experience I had, and the one that I wanted to share today while working on this book, was when I volunteered on an archaeological dig in northern Iceland for six weeks, mm -hmm. where we uncovered the floor plan of one of the houses that Gudrid may have lived in. Oh, wow. And I remember very clearly when I first learned about this archaeological project, it was in 2002, so 20 years ago. And by then I'd been working as a science writer for a magazine published by Penn State University for about 20 years. But I'd been interested in Iceland and the Icelandic sagas even longer than that ever since my first year in college when I learned that J.R.R. Tolkien used to teach the literature of the Vikings at Oxford. And he and his friend C.S. Lewis had a club where they translated Icelandic sagas for fun. And I thought that sounded like a great, uh, you know, life plan. So I was leading this double life, as I like to say. Science writing by day, reading sagas by night, and one day in 2002, I'm sitting at my desk at Penn State University, and a professor from the anthropology department called and told me that he was among a team of archaeologists who had discovered a Viking age longhouse on a farm in northern Iceland. And so I asked, which farm? And he said, well, it's called Glumbyer, and it's in the Scottish years. And I bet I am the only science writer in America who would then reply, you mean the farm that Gudrid, the far traveler, lived on when she came back from North America? Wow. Um, that was the farm. Wow. So I decided right then I had to write a book about it. Mm -hmm. And I had been looking for a way to combine my two interests in science and sagas for a long time. Initially, I thought I was writing a book about archaeology, about new techniques in archaeology mm -hmm. using the story of Gudrid as an example. Um, because what they were doing at the dig in Glombar was fine-tuning this method of using remote sensing, using microwaves and um, radar waves to see beneath the soil, and soil sampling. And that method is now pretty standard in archaeology, but back in you know, 2002, it was still being developed. And they let me join them for one field season. Wow. Like I said, when we, we just dug down far enough to uncover the top of the walls to see if the map that our remote sensing instruments were giving us was correct. And I was actually working on the dig then when I got a call from my editor at Parkworth Books. And we talked about you know how the, how the book was coming and my research. And he said, you know, you've been thinking about this book the wrong way. The, the science is really not the most important part. What we want to know about is Gudrid. We want to know what her life was like. So why don't you just write a book about Gudrid and use the archaeology to explain, you know, what, you know, how she lived. And I thought, are you kidding? You're going to pay me to write about the Icelandic sagas? It was like, you know, this epiphany, this great gift. Suddenly, they realized that what I was fascinated by was of interest to other people, too. Mm -hmm. So we did find this 
this house at Glenbire. Um, it was twice the size of the houses that archaeologists have dug up that were built by Eric the Red, Leif Erikson's father, in Greenland and in Iceland. And Gudrid also lived in that area where Eric the Red was in Greenland, because she was married to one of his sons. Um, but the Glombar house is twice the size of Eric the Red's houses. And there were these little extra rooms attached to the main hall, the same way as the houses they dug up in Newfoundland at Lancer Meadows. So it links this house in design wow. to the houses that Gudrid may have lived in in Newfoundland. So there's this wonderful archaeological connection between these three sites all through the character of Gudrid from the saga. Now, because of the way archaeology works in Iceland, um, because of the volcanoes in Iceland, you have layers of tephra, of volcanic ash, that you know, land on the ground after each eruption. And each eruption has its own chemical signature and usually a different color. So at Glumbar, we could see this layer of ash from an eruption of Mount Hecla in 1104. And it was bright white. It was like a chalk line. And the, uh, the remains of Goodrich House were all underneath that layer. So oh, wow. dated, you know, definitely to at least 50 years earlier because of you know, the amount of dirt we had to get you know, rid of between the 1104 layer and, and her house. And probably it was still around the year 1000. So again, it, it fits perfectly into what the sagas say about Goodrich. And, you know, what they tell us is that she lived at, at Glumbar until her son, <coughs> Snorri, was married. And Snorri is the boy that was born in North America. Um, so when he married, Gudrid set off on this pilgrimage to Rome. And then when she returned, Snorri had built her a church at Glumbar, and she lived there for the rest of her life as a nun or a holy woman. So that's what my first book about Gudrid covers, what history and archaeology can tell us about Gudrid and her time. And as I said, this book, The Far Traveler, is nonfiction or history. And in it, I try to be very clear about what we really know about Gudrid and what we're only guessing about. Now, I published that book in 2007, and I thought I had said all there was to say about Gudrid. But her spirit disagreed. <laughs> because for years after that, I kept hearing her voice in my head. So I had to write another book about her. And I realized it had to be a novel, even though I'm mostly a nonfiction writer. This is the only novel I've published. Uh, because only in fiction writing are you allowed to fill in the gap. Mm. You know, what did Goodwin look like? What did she like to do? How did she talk? What did she think of her adventures? In fiction, you can also make sense of the contradictions in the historical material. For example, you know, I mentioned that there are these two medieval sagas about Gudrid, the saga of Eric the Red and the saga of the Greenlanders. But they contradict each other, and we can't tell which one is true and which one isn't. In one of the sagas, Gudrid gets married three times. In the other saga, she only gets married twice. In one saga, when she first arrives in Greenland, she is shipwrecked and loses everything. So she is very, very poor when she meets Leif Erikson and his brother, and she ends up marrying the brother. But in the other saga, she's very rich when she arrives in Greenland because she comes with her father, and they have packed up not only their farm, but also the neighbors came with them. So they had two households full of goods on this ship, but they got lost and they ran out of fresh water and food and just thought everybody else on the ship died except for Gudrid and her father. So they end up in Greenland with a ship in good condition and all the stuff that two families would have brought wow. to settle in a new land. So they were fabulously rich. So which was it? Is Gudrid rich or is she poor? Now, I had to decide. And that's what makes writing fiction so much fun. But it also makes it easy to make mistakes. So no matter how much of an expert you are, 
you can still, you know, make mistakes. And there are a few in, in that book that I challenge people to find. <laughs> that's what I wanted to tell you um, about Goodred, uh, Jeff. So I'll turn it back over to you. Okay. And uh, hope to hear from my fellow writers. Okay. And I did I, I did show, um, and thank you, Gretchen uh, had sent the book covers, or I had the book covers here for it. And uh, I brought Great. them up while you were speaking. And um, so, um, and these are available out at uh, is at Amazon too, or where's the best place absolutely. to find them? Absolutely, yeah, okay. absolutely. And and I'm really happy to say that there's even an audio book coming out. Oh, the fantastic! Book of our traveler, it's it's being recorded right now, and I mean that's really kind of strange for a 20 year old book to get an audio book now, but it's coming out soon. Now that's actually it happens a lot, and uh, I've been uh, working on that a little bit uh, myself, doing some narration. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is, and it, it it's it's far time for that to happen because I'm a person who I I, I love to read, but I have to it, I. Forgive me for saying this, but sometimes when I'm reading, <laughs> I get about a chapter in, and then. I'm, I'm dozing off and it, it's just that well, this with one's me. for you then Jeff. This <laughs> one's for you. so I do audiobooks I love to listen to audiobooks I I love them and uh, I have a I have a ton of them that I haven't even listened to yet so I think that's great I think that everyone should do that is get an audiobook uh, done for your uh, your writing and uh, get it out there because that definitely just perpetuates the um, the, the number of uh, people that get to read it and experience all the research that you've done. So, wow. Thank you very much. That's great. Um, let's see. And, uh, I'm going to turn this over now. Let's see. Let's, um, let's go with, uh, Heather, um, Heather Gilbert. Um, now I know that, uh, you have, uh, done a uh, written a book as well. Um, but, uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, your, uh, portion of all of this and your, um, being in the episode number four, uh, with this particular story. Well, sure. Um, I'll just start by saying it's just, it is so cool to me to be listening to Nancy Marie Brown. Um, that was part of what helped me as I wrote uh, my take on Goodred's life with a historical uh, fiction novel. Um, so that's just, it's awesome for me just to sit here and listen. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, I guess my interest in biking started, um, you know, growing up, my grandma day always told me we were related to Eric the Red and Leif Erikson through my, through her husband, my grandpa day. Um, so, you know, in school, when they would talk about Leif Erikson and Eric the Red as a kid, I was always like, oh, yay, you know, <laughs> I, I'm related to them. But then um, it wasn't until I, well, actually, and my grandpa day's family um, came over in the 1900s. Um, his mother was a Swedish Sami uh, reindeer herder, and his father is from Trondheim, Norway, and his last name was Torvaldsen. So when they came over, they changed their name today so that it would be easier. That's why, uh, you know, my my writing name is Heather Day Gilbert. Um, so that's just a little background on my Viking heritage, uh, such as it is. But it wasn't until I was grown and I had kids of my own um, that I really, I've always been kind of a Viking nerd, I guess you would say, always, you know, soaking up any information I can find. And um, I bought this, The Sagas of Icelanders, which is what Nancy Marie was talking about. And um, of course, I really migrated to the two sagas that uh, included Eric the Red and Leif Erikson. And um, I kind of put together and I feel like I probably, since our name would have been Torvaldsen, possibly we were related to Eric the Red's son Torvald, who actually died in North America um, from a scrailing or, you know, Native American arrow kind of accidentally hit him and he died over here and they never have been able to find his body or anything like that. Wow. Um, but I'm assuming that is how I'm related. Um, but so that was kind of interesting to me, but even more interesting as I read these saga stories, which are very bare bones stories. If you read them, they are, um, they're just very, uh, there's not a lot of details. Like Nancy Marie was saying, we don't really know how to fill in all those blanks. Um, but these two women kept showing up in them and it was Gudrid and her sister-in-law Freitas, who is another, uh, Freitas is a, uh, probably a favorite of mine, um, but she is a wild child. So I did get to write a book about both of them. Um, God's Daughter was my first book, and I don't know how to get this. Um, oh, perfect. Here you go. Mm -hmm. 
that was my first um, historical novel. So it's basically a biographical historical novel. It's written in first person. So basically you are in Gudrid's head um, as, and I tried, uh, I worked a long time trying to piece together those two sagas because like Nancy Marie said, they don't all add up perfectly. So you kind of really have to think things through. How could this have happened? And, and I always looked at it as if it really happened. I, I really believe it happened. And as the other ones who have spoken have said, you know, archaeological finds and different things since um, even, you know, more recent years, they always seem to prove that the sagas were true. So I just operated from that um, perspective. I looked into old Norse terminology a lot more with this book, uh, God's Daughter. Uh, my second book was based on Freitas, um, which is Eric, Eric's illegitimate daughter, um, who also sailed to North America. So um, I just found it fascinating that both of these women had sailed to North America. They had done very memorable things over here. Um, Gudrid um, spoke with the Native Americans. She, um, as Gretchen said, she's kind of a, a diplomat in that way. She was trying to work together between the two cultures. Um, and then you have Freitas, who has a whole different story. Um, <laughs> wow. And to me, I actually had to take, I don't know if it was two or three years between writing these two books, um, just to try, because I do write in first person. So I really had to get into Freitas's head and understand why she did certain things she did. In particular, um, I'm thinking there was a massacre uh, that occurred, um, you know, instigated by her and of her fellow Vikings. Um, so I had to really think to myself, and that was kind of the point as I thought through these books is, you know, I mean, people in that time, they were still people. They still had relationships like all of us do. They had marriages, they had children, they had in-laws, um, which we read a lot about in the sagas. And so I really wanted to bring all those relationships to life through the eyes of the main characters. So it did take me at least, I'm thinking three years to really think through Freitas. Why would any woman, um, you know, do the things that she did? Um, and it was just interesting for me. Also with Gudrid, I really was interested in the fact that she had been, uh, you know, like a pagan seeress, but then she accepted Christianity when it came into uh, her life, which for me as a Christian author, that was really an interesting angle to oh, yeah, explore. Sure. And okay. so, um, yeah, so all my Viking historicals, they are considered Christian historical fiction. Um, they kind of fall into that category. Um, but those are my first two books. And then I also have um, some other just completely fictional Viking books. This is a Christian novella about uh, a Viking in Ireland. And this is my latest of last year. I wrote with a co-author, Jen Kudmore, who is also really into Vikings like I am. And so we co-wrote this, which is set on a fictional island that called Tavlan. So it's called Tavlan Vikings. And then the second book in the series um, will be releasing in June of next year. So I still have my hand in with Vikings. Um, they're just always gonna be intrinsically fascinating for me. Um, but I also write, uh, contemporary cozy mysteries set in my home state of West Virginia. So that's kind of what you'll see. I, you know, I'm in completely different genres. Um, I have 22 books out now total. So wow. you'll probably be able to look on my, uh, my website is heatherdaygilbert.com and you can look on there and under the books page and just find all the different types of books that I write. Um, but God's Daughter is available in audiobook, and um, all of my books are available in soft cover. And I think all of my books are available in Kindle Unlimited right now, too. So, um, wow. but yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot more to say, but I, I totally understand what Nancy Marie was saying about Gudrid getting inside your head and not letting go. Um, I kind of have that with Freitas. So she is definitely uh, the one that. I, I cannot. Um, oh, I see a comment down there. That's nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. That's, so, Linda. That's Linda. Or she's uh, helping out with the chat. Yeah. She yeah. said she's read seven of your books already. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, that's awesome. Um, yeah. Like I say, I write in all different genres, but, but Freitas really was the one 
she was really tricky to write. And, but you know what? I was really pleased with it. And that book got a publisher's weekly start review. So I felt like wow. I did something right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, that's about all, all about me. You can find all my books definitely on Amazon and also on um, my website, heatherdaygilbert.com. And I'm going to have to reset my light. It just went out here, but Wow, that's fantastic. Now, I one question I had for you too. Now, when you said you wrote the fictional books, do you I would imagine that you still draw upon known factual information mm -hmm. into the story as you go oh, along? Yeah. Yes. And I think all historical authors probably realize that sometimes we are going to have anachronisms. We might use a term that we should not have used at that time period. But definitely with God's daughter, I tried extremely hard to get those details right. And the other thing is for God's daughter and fourth child, I was pulling, I was using the sagas as the bones of my story. I basically pulled from that and wanted to flesh that out in first person point of view from the first book is Gudrid and the second book is Freitas. So um, yes, those were heavily drawn from the sagas. And that's why I have to laugh when people review it like, oh, you know, nobody could have been that beautiful or had that many husbands. And I'm like, just go back to the sagas. You know, that is what they say about her. That's right. what she was remembered for, you know, her beauty and her wisdom and, and her kindness, I think. Um, so it's, I, those were very, those two books were drawn directly from the sagas. Our other books, just, we do a lot of outside research about that Viking time period, uh, whichever one we're in. Um, this one is when the Normans are, um, you know, coming in. So that's a little bit different time period. But it's definitely um, we try to keep things true to the period. Right. But my last three that I showed you or the last two and the one that's coming out are fictional. So those are characters are completely fictional. The characters in the first two are good and, and Freitas. Yeah. Wow. Those are Fantastic. That, that's so fascinating. And, and, and again, I'm glad you have an audio book uh, on a couple because. Mm -hmm. I've got, uh, I think I've got five free credits right now with oh, Audible, yes. so I can go get these and then I can <laughs> listen to them. Uh, so that's right. Thank you so much. That's really interesting. Um, okay, so let's go to Tanya now. Tanya, uh, I will say, folks, uh, uh, speaks uh, uh, some English. Uh, so we're going to have uh, Paula help her a little bit uh, as we go along here. So I'm going to do my best to what I'm going to do. Uh, rather than uh, bring up a solo picture, I'm going to try to remove all of us down below and leave Tanya up there with Paulo so he can help. Uh, if you don't mind, we'll, we'll try this real quick. So uh, bear with me while I click a few buttons here and uh, bring some of us down below, including my... Traduce me. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, so... Go ahead, if you don't mind, uh, go ahead and help us along with uh, your information. Now, you were involved in episodes one and two... Uh, was it one, two, and three? All three? I, I know. No, we're... one and two. Okay, one and two. Only okay. one and two. Yeah, so very, very good. So that was, thank you. So <laughs> thank I'll, you. I'll let you two go ahead. So tell us a little bit about your information with Gudrid the Fair. Okay. So, allora, <laughs> so first of all, we're going to take this uh, section a little slow because we're going to do a little translation from Italian to English and vice versa. So... Allora, ha detto la tua connessione con Gudrid e come sei connessa a questa storia, diciamo? Ok. <ride> ok, okay perfetto. E tu traduci? Sì, però facciamo okay. pezzo per pezzo che piano piano, ok? Ok. Allora, io mi sono sempre occupata di più dei templari e di tutto quello che riguardava i templari e i vichinghi in Europa. Okay, so basically Tanya has always mainly worried about Templars and a little bit about the Vikings that were around Europe, but mainly connected to Templars as primary. È molto interessante scopri aver scoperto ultimamente con, uh, con Luca e con uh, con l'episodio 4 che effettivamente c'erano queste donne anche, mh, diciamo collegate al sacro che hanno portato una, cultu una cultura, hanno portato la cultura dall'Europa in America senza che noi lo sapessimo, perché l'abbiamo ignorato fino a quando non, è, non è stata scoperta l'America e soprattutto anche quando è stata scoperta l'America l'abbiamo 
abbiamo iniziato a fare eh, questi studi di migrazione antecedenti solamente negli ultimi anni. Okay, so she thinks it's very interesting that as of lately we have been able to um, identify and see the importance of this sacred woman that they brought to history and their ability to go across uh, across the Atlantic and basically find new lands such as Americas uh, and whatnot. So it is very interesting for her to find out and being connected with this, thanks to my dad, uh, taking part in episode four. Se proprio poi vogliamo aggiungere, in effetti i Templari, quando hanno, sono tornati da Gerusalemme, loro erano anche dei grandi, quando hanno vissuto anche in Francia, soprattutto nel sud della Francia, dove c'era una grande impronta celtica, un'impronta celtica che c'era anche, um, anche in Scozia e che probabilmente avevano ereditato dai vichinghi, nel senso che si era mescolata la cultura celtica e la cultura vichinga del nord Europa i templari avevano una grande conoscenza anche di questi rituali e che quindi probabilmente loro stessi erano i primi a conoscere l'emigrazione dei vichinghi e di tutto quello che era collegato diciamo al sacro femminile no? quindi se vogliamo parlare di Gudrid vogliamo parlare di Maria Maddalena sono tutte eh, personaggi femminili che secondo me nell'ombra hanno fatto un po' la storia del mondo anche se è prettamente maschile la storia del mondo quella che conosciamo ok so basically it's very fascinating that once the Templars came from Jerusalem to France and in Scotland that they were met by Celtic traditions that were also mixed up with Vikings uh, beliefs and created the two and it is very important to understand that even though the Templars were aware of these traditions and history, they preserved it and found it very important of how these uh, rituals that were practiced by Celtic people that were basically passed down also by Vikings mixing together um, have been portrayed in history. And even though with the Templars, it has always been um, shown as like male role tending to take most of the... Uh, Um, most of the attention or, or the credit, it is also important that, like Tanya said, that the sacred women that took part of the history and, and shaped it are, found, are basically there in the foundations, thanks to this. E poi studierò il resto perché sono completamente ignorante in materia. Okay, and she says that at the end she's going to study a bit more because she's not too uh, accustomed with this story of uh, Gudrid or the Viking sagas. Grazie, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, we did our best to try to uh, connect the information. <laughs> All right, so I'm bringing everybody back up here. Let's see, who am I missing? Oh, okay, um, Andrea. Uh, no, you, did, you didn't miss me because I, I did get a chance to speak earlier. But um, I, di I did want to latch on to what has been uh, said so far and, and just mention two things. Uh, one, an addition to what has been said. And then the second thing is a, is a question, uh, basically, to, to mostly to Nancy and Heather. Uh, the first thing I wanted to say was that uh, it has been mentioned how uh, we are learning more and more about, uh, about uh, this particular aspect of history and a lot of things that uh, people were very, very skeptical about now turn out to be uh, closer to the truth, et cetera. And I just wanted to give an example uh, that linked to my own um, research. I mentioned at the outset um, the, th this very important uh, text and map uh, put together by these two Venetian navigators in uh, the 1300s uh, and how Uh, their, their, uh, their text uh, and their map was later for political reasons uh, accused of being um, a, a hoax, a fa false, uh, right. false document. Uh, and so my effort, in essence, has been to try to restore the veracity of this uh, uh, text. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, was very intriguing to me was 
the description that these two Venetian navigators gave of um, a monastery that they visited in Iceland uh, in, in the late 1300s. And uh, the, the description they make of, of the monastery and the life within the monastery is so detailed, so precise, and so utterly fascinating. Uh, the way they grew their vegetables, the heating system, uh, the way they collected the wood from the, um, from, uh, the beaches, uh, the, the, the way they cooked uh, bread using uh, geothermal uh, energy, etc. Anyway, it, wow. this was an extraordinary description uh, to be uh, made in the 1300s. And it was typically Venetian in flavor, in the sense that Venetians were very practical men. Uh, uh, they knew about uh, building ships. They knew about build, uh, constructing houses. Uh, they were essentially merchants. And so their descriptions kind of reflects this uh, uh, attitude, this, this uh, Venetian mindset. Now, of course, it was, uh, they were later accused of having invented this, uh, that this monastery never existed, that they were uh, describing things that uh, were not there. Well, uh, I, I, I traveled to Iceland to see if I could find traces of this uh, monastery. Uh, now, monasteries in Iceland were uh, destroyed after the Reformation, uh, and uh, uh, they gradually disappeared from view. Uh, they were buried in, uh, under ashes, under earth, so that there are no visible monasteries in Iceland today. But there used to be very important monasteries, of course. But they, they had since, since disappeared. Now, with the help of a, a wonderful archaeologist in Iceland, her name is uh, Dr. Steinun uh, uh, Christian Dotir. She is uh, probably the most eminent archaeologist dealing in the field with monasteries, with uh, trying to locate these monasteries and, uh, and, and beginning to, to um, initiate digs uh, in, the, in the area. Well, I went to her and I told her, look, I'm trying to locate um, uh, the traces of this monastery described by uh, these two Venetians uh, and the name was, was Thikva Baya Klaustur and uh, she pointed, she, she helped me uh, uh, locate what, what she believed was the location of, of this monastery and I, I drove out there and, uh, uh, and with her help uh, we, we got a better sense of the place. But of course, everything was underground. Uh, and yet I, I convinced myself because of the geographical location and all the, uh, the descriptions given by the Venetians that this had to be the place where the monastery was. Well, it happens to just a few uh, years ago after I published the book, uh, that same Dr. Uh, Stein on um, uh, Christian Dottir did actually begin a dig precisely where we had thought the monastery was. And now the dig is well advanced and it is now clear and patent that the, the monastery described by the Venetians was in fact there where they always said it was. Uh, and it was probably the most important monastery uh, in right. Iceland. So this is just an example uh, of what we were talking about, of uh, how more and more information is coming out from the ground and helping us uh, validate a lot of the uh, stories that have uh, remained in the eyes of many uh, legends or fictional account. And more and more, we are filling out the tassels of these pictures and, and seeing, uh, and, and all these elements are, are helping us in, uh, in gaining a better historical sense of these uh, events. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask really was a question more than uh, 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 something that I wanted to ask myself was b being Italian, of course, and living in Rome, I'm, I'm, I'm really quite fascinated by Gudrid's uh, pilgrimage to Rome. Uh, it was an extraordinary journey. And when I was in Iceland and Greenland researching this book, uh, 
my, uh, I was constantly thinking about Goodread. Of course, the landscape uh, uh, it encouraged me to do so. And of course, when I was traveling in those countries, I was reading the, the Icelandic sagas. And so uh, I was with Gudrid uh, often. My mind was with her. And, and I, I became utterly fascinated with her, with her courage, with her sense of mission, with uh, uh, the, the extraordinary things that she lived through. And most especially, I was fascinated by her journey to Rome. The idea that a thousand years ago, a young woman uh, uh, could uh, make her way yeah, all across right. uh, Europe. I mean, coming all the way from those northern lands, all the way to, to Rome and back was, was utterly fascinating to me. And so I was wondering whether Nancy and Heather, Heather could tell us something more about that specific part of Gudrid's life, her, her pilgrimage to, no, to Rome, if, 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 if we know much about it at all. Jeff, do you have me on? Yes, you are. Okay, because I can answer that one. All Thank right. you, Andrea. <laughs> okay. I really love the description of the uh, monastery in Northern Iceland because uh, that's what I'm researching right now. And I have Stain on Christian's Daughter's book right on my desk. So <laughs> that was quite exciting. Um, Gudrid, one thing I have to point out, when Gudrid went to Rome, she was not a young woman. She was a grandmother. Oh, wow. And I think that makes it even more special. Yep. Mm -hmm. Because even if you can be a grandmother at 40, of course, but for a woman of you know, an advanced age to still be that adventurous and, create, and courageous and to want to you know, cross the known world, you know, which it really was for her coming from Iceland all the way to Rome. It was, it was quite a journey, quite a feat. Now, there are many people in the Icelandic sagas who are said to have gone to Rome. It really was more common than you think. And later in the 1200s, when the sagas were actually being written in some of the contemporary sagas from that time, there are many women who went to Rome also, uh, who went to Rome to petition you know, the Pope for you know, to see if they could have a child if they went to Rome and prayed in the right spot, you know, this sort of thing. Um, it may have been a little bit more difficult in, in Gudrid's time around the year 1000 than it was in 1200, but it was still quite a, quite a journey. Now, there are two ways that she could have gone. Um, the trade routes were quite well known between Iceland and Norway at that time, and also Iceland and Ireland and Scotland. So she could have gone to Scotland, for instance, to the Hebrides, which was very closely connected to Iceland, um, and then traveled down through England and crossing the Channel that way and going through France. Um, I suggest in my book that she may have gone at the same time that King Canute went to Rome for the um, when the emperor was being crowned. And that was about as if I can remember correctly, 1026. Now, the new dates that we have out of Lansom Meadows dates the house there at 1021. So it doesn't quite work out. We don't really know what, what Gudrid's lifespan was anymore. I had always figured she was about 982, uh, which was when she was born. So 1026 would have made her grandmother. Um, if she's much younger than that, then we have to think of another another large group of people going to Rome that she might have joined. Uh, the other way to go would be to go to Bergen or Trondheim and then south from Norway to Denmark and through Germany and across the Alps that way. And that was also a very well-known pilgrim route. There were many people going from, from Denmark south. So she would have joined a group of pilgrims and she would have had to walk the entire way wow. from you know, wherever she took landfall in the European continent. So the pilgrim routes were set up that way. I mean, we can still walk the Santiago de Compostela uh, route, and I think there are even some in, in Italy now that you can walk the pilgrim way. So it was a reasonable day's hike from one monastery to the next or one inn to the next. And some of those monasteries still have guest books from... The, around the year 1000. Oh, wow. And 
Uh, researchers have found over 25 Icelandic women's names. Really? Wow, that's, so we have, that's fascinating. Yeah, it is really exciting, but Gudrid is not one of those names. Really? So oh, no. we do not have her actual name in the guest book, but we do have uh, many, many other women of the time who went south. But it's still it's a remarkable journey. Wow. Um, mm-hmm. The other thing that we don't actually know is what she did when she got to Rome. Um, I really wish that um, Margaret Elphinstone had been able to join us ah, today. I know. Because her book, The Sea Road, is a reimagining of Gudrid's pilgrimage to Rome and what may have happened there. And mm-hmm. she very beautifully expresses or creates the, the idea that, that Goodrich met the Pope and you know, discussed Greenland and the New World with him. Uh, that probably didn't happen. We don't have any actual source, any historical source that says Goodrich did meet the Pope. Uh, we certainly hope that she did. Mm-hmm. And there may be hiding in the Vatican archives that no researcher has found. There may be some uh. kind of a uh, description of it. This is the this is the you know holy grail for uh, Viking scholars is to be able to get into the Vatican and find that that discussion. But so far, as far as I know, it hasn't been found. Um, but it it um, it actually inspired my next book after Goodrid, which is a biography of the Pope who was the Pope of the year 1000, Sylvester II. And his uh, French name was Gerbert d'Oriac, or Gerbert of Oriac. And he was the leading astronomer and mathematician of his time. He taught how to use the astrolabe and how to calculate the circumference of the Earth. He was the person who brought Arabic numerals into the teaching of Western Europe. He was extremely interested in one of the major debates in the in the Christian church at that time, which was, if there are people on the other side of the globe, are they Christian? And do we have a duty to go find out Mm -hmm. and to bring them the word of Christ if they are not? Right. So this was one of the discussions at the time of the year 1000 in Rome. And if Gudrid had made it when Gerbert was on the throne, I think the world would have been different. They certainly would have had something very important to talk about, and they would have clicked. Unfortunately, the Pope, after Gerbert, were not so interested in mathematics and science, and by 1030 or so, he was even labeled a sorcerer. Oh, wow. being able to calculate things like how many pieces of slate of a certain size do you need to tile the floor of the church just by looking at it. So, Mm -hmm. um, anyway, that was a a big digression into... uh, into the uh, story of the, the Pope of the year 1000. I call the book The Abacus and the Cross. Uh, he's another fascinating character from that time that wow. I, I hope more people knew about. But again, if, if I was going to be writing alternative history to have Gudrid meet Pope Sylvester II would have been just mm-hmm. a phenomenal possibility. So um, that's open for you know fiction writers. <laughs> <laughs> Heather, you can pick that one up. Oh, man, I I totally defer to you because, you know, my book mostly focused on the time uh, before she long before she went over there. And really, the sagas only give, I want to say, a paragraph or two really short paragraphs to that time of her life. So I didn't really go into, you know, her journey to Rome. It was clear that she lived uh, as a Christian all her life and her, uh, you know, once she became a Christian and that her children and children's children and um, they all, you know, became, many of them became monks or whatever. And of course we know she became a nun. So, um, that was about as far as I got with that research. So this was all fascinating for me to listen to you, Nancy. <laughs> Thanks for the question there. You know, one of the, the reasons that they think that her saga was actually written down and, and, you know, a lot of women's stories were not told. They mm-hmm. think it was written down because one of her descendants who was a bishop, was being put forward as a possible saint. And so in order to have someone sainted at that time, you need to tell the story of, you know, their ancestors and, and you know, what what qualified this person to be a saint. And one of the things that qualified him was that he was descended from Gudrid, who 
had this mm-hmm. reputation as a holy woman, but also had this very exciting you know, background. So mm-hmm. you know, it, it's wonderful for us to have the story now because someone um, mm-hmm. was interested in her religious side. Mm-hmm. And they didn't just tell us how good a woman was, she was, but also what she did in her life. So that's mm-hmm. a, you know, a gift to us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we had a, a question here from uh, one of the viewers, uh, and I believe this would be for uh, Andrea. Um, what was the name of the archaeologist in Iceland in uh, the title of her book? Um, the name is Steinun Christian Dottir, uh, and uh, I didn't mention any book. Uh, oh, okay. We were just working together, but okay. uh, but uh, she, she but just maybe... put out a book that's called. Go ahead. Yeah, Nancy. go ahead. They put out a book called Monastic Iceland. Ah, Monastic Iceland. Okay, well, there you go. All right. um, I guess we can write write the name down. Yeah, uh, it, yep. Uh, Linda's taking care of that for us right now. Thank you, Linda. Appreciate it. Um, Luca had uh, had his hand up a moment ago. I think he wanted to add something. Plus, we need to also get Paolo in here uh, and uh, introduce him and what he's done for this. But go ahead, Luca. Yeah, I would like to add something uh, regarding the monastery place, uh, the second uh, digging area in 2015, where these uh, archaeologists uh, find uh, found out the, the real position under the ground. We have been there, and it's in the episode four. It's visible. I mean, it's a uh, visible the marker because the rest is under the ground, like Andrea told us before. And j- just right after that, there is Andrea interview explaining about the, the Zeno brothers in uh, the brook, uh, about uh, their experience uh, in uh, finding out the existence of the monastery in Iceland. So there are two things connected in episode four. That's what I would like to add. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, you have, uh, you know, learned, I guess, I, I don't know how long you've been doing this, uh, but your uh, aerial cinematography is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have been, uh, you are instrumental, I think, in putting together uh, your, your father. You must have learned from your father, I would assume, about doing cinematography, mm-hmm. but uh, you have a, a knack for this and it's very good. Tell us a little bit about how you got started with it and uh, where you're going with it in the future. Of course. Uh, hello, everybody. Again, for anybody who has tuned in late, I am uh, the son of uh, Luca, who is the film director of the series The Templars. And uh, I'm actually the video uh, drone videographer since episode two. Um, so in the first episode, the videographer was uh, the drone videographer was actually uh, Luca Bracali. Mm-hmm. And uh, I have been, uh, when we were in France for that episode, I've always had an interest in drones. And uh, it always seemed really interesting to have an aerial perspective of what you can see. And very, very, very interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. And every time he would go for a flight with the drone, uh, I was always interested to learn, uh, to see how things were done. And uh, always just taking a backstage look at it. And then after I heard that he wasn't going to be t- uh, doing episode two for the series, uh, my dad then asked me if I was comfortable enough to try out <laughs> and pick up the drone for the first time. And uh, I-, I said yes, of course. Uh, and that was my very first time ever really using a drone that wasn't like a 10 or $20 drone that you can find <laughs> right. anywhere. Um So very, very big jump for me uh, because it's something that is a professional job, as many of you guys know out there. And I will say that when growing up, I used to play uh, quite a bit of uh, video games on consoles. And as you guys can see here, I have a controller, which is (laughs) pretty similar, almost similar to a drone um, controller, in fact. So it really wasn't that hard of a transition going from that type of controller to a drone. Uh, The only thing that was a bit uh, scary at times was knowing that you were using a machinery that was kind of expensive. And if anything goes wrong, you're responsible for it. (laughs) So that has always been in the back of my mind and always made me 
uh, alert on what to do and what not to do. Now, episode two, personally, once we were done with it, my dad and many uh, people with the feedback said they enjoyed it. But <laughs> since it was my first time ever using a drone, I, I didn't really think of it as much. I, I thought I could always do better, learn more, practice more. And, uh, and I did. And when we actually filmed uh, episode three, I felt more comfortable with myself. I, I was um, able to adjust certain uh, lighting on my own without my dad helping me out. And that felt very, um, very good because I was learning something on my own. And of course, thanks to my dad, he pushed me to do this. So I have to thank him for this. Mm -hmm. And it's really great to be part of this team. I. I do not know much as many of uh, the other guests on here today. I, you know, the information I hear is like today from the podcast and also from my dad explaining uh, what he's read and what he's working on. So I'm not an expert on that, but I try my best whenever we go to the locations that we have to film with the drone to understand a little bit about the history of what we're doing yeah. on the spot, because exactly. it's very important. Especially when we were in Scotland, many of the castles we visited and many of the locations were very fascinating. And I also really like uh, the history about Vikings and Templars. I have many um, uh, little collections of uh, figurines of mm -hmm. both. Um, and yes, and uh, now that episode four is coming out next week, very excited. I hope, um, you know, the work has been... Um, consistent i hope you guys enjoy it as much as uh, episode three um and i have to say it was very very beautiful to uh film in iceland i you hear it everywhere that iceland is the land for drones uh many people go there with that and uh take many beautiful shots and we got lucky enough a couple of days we had beautiful weather uh we had four hours of uh of daylight and we captured some i personally think some amazing shots and hopefully, I'm sure my dad put them all together and they came out fantastic. So I, I hope you guys are prepared for this uh, <laughs> just as much as I am. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's fantastic. And uh, I know that Andrea uh, has to leave us. Uh, he has a, a, another appointment. But thank you so much, Andrea, for being here today. We appreciate your uh, input. You're welcome. Sure. It's, been great. it's been great. And it's been great seeing all of you. And I've learned so much. And it's, it was lots of fun. So thank you all. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Tanya, Paolo, Gretchen, Luca, Heather, Nancy, everybody. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Bye -bye now. Yep. Have a great day. Um, Paolo, you know, it, it, I, and I will say that uh, during my time of watching, um, you know, episode two and then episode three, um, you could tell that you, I, I honestly, I didn't know that uh, you were, you know, doing it i didn't pay attention in number two that you had done it then but three uh just captivated me and folks i'm going to tell you if you have not yet seen any of these you need to check them out and they are stunningly beautiful but also the story that is being told in these episodes by um, tanya and the other uh people that have put into so much work into these is fabulous and you don't want to miss this but the cinematography is very very good i i have to say and i cannot wait to see episode number four and uh and what we have in that as well so uh very good work um uh, paro thank you thank you thank you very much um so you know i okay we're we're at about an hour and a half um i didn't know if anyone uh, you know we've covered so much about goodrid and about uh what is happening in this particular episode um you know, and I, 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 we we were able to kind of do a little bit of a roundtable a little bit there with Andrea in, in his question. Uh, is there anything else that uh, we would like to discuss? We can do a little bit of a like a little bit of an open forum here uh, now that you have this opportunity with all of you together. And of course, uh, Nancy, uh, Maria uh, on the brown and Brown on the phone. Would you like to like maybe talk amongst yourselves? You have this opportunity here a little bit, uh, and Gretchen's been so good being and quiet since this <laughs> since the beginning there. So uh, I'm going to open it up to uh, to any of you that would like to uh, add something to this. <laughs> but uh, I know that. Go ahead. Sorry. 
Did we have any reader, any questions from the viewers? I can't see those over my, con I just wondered if there were any viewer questions about Gudrid. Okay. Well, the episode. There has been some, um, and uh, Linda has been uh, putting them up on the screen as she finds them. Let me scroll back a little bit. Yeah, there's the one about the book. Mm -hmm. um, let's see here. Or if people have any, they could type yeah, them in. Yeah, if anyone has a question that you would like to ask any of our guests that are here today, please do that. Uh, and Linda will bring them up on the screen. I'm going to scroll back and have a look here. Um, but this has been fascinating. It's been an awesome look into, like I mentioned earlier when we first got going here, that this was something that I had no idea who Goodred was. And uh, also, um, oh, there we go. There we have a question. Are there plans to release mm -hmm. the series to the rest of the world? I live in Sweden and would love to be able to see it. Okay, I can answer to this. Okay. Uh, after we're going to be finished it, um, with the episode uh, 5 in July this uh, year, we're going to um, uh, do agreement with other platforms worldwide to uh, release the different uh, language version of the entire series because uh, so far we couldn't do it because uh, basically we are on Prime Video. And also, the series is not completed. They want mm. to uh, have uh, the possibility mm. to get the full series, not uh, an episode every four or six months like we have done. So um, also, we have to wait for an eventual season two uh, investor because um, it's still, uh, it's still uh, in the middle of the thing. But uh, yes, we are going to do something to show the full series of road. Okay, fantastic. Um, one person that we definitely do not want to leave out, of course, we have Margaret, who is another uh, author that is part of this. Um, she unfortunately could not be here today with us because she is under the weather uh, with a bit of an illness. So she could not participate in this, but she has contributed uh, to this. And uh, we will see her in episode number four. Uh, another person is the actress, Amy Johnson. Uh, who uh, portrays uh, Goodred the Fair in this episode. And I do have a picture of her. Uh, this is one of her in costume. And I want to show this really quickly here for everyone to see. Oops, let me go to this one here. There we go. Um, and this is Amy Johnson. She's an actress. Uh, Luca might be able to add some more information about her. But, um, you know, you mentioned before, um, I, and I forget which one of you said this might have been Heather about talking about uh, she was depicted as being very beautiful. I think we have the uh, a very uh, perfect actress here to play that part, I think. Um, so tell us a little bit more, if you can, Luca, about uh, Amy. Absolutely. Uh, Amy, that uh, I understood they're going to interview her uh, tomorrow. Uh, so she's going to be uh, shown in a different kind of interview, more cinematographic. And uh, because today was more related with the history stuff and the authors of the books. So she's going to have her own uh, specific space. And the idea to uh, get uh, Amy, uh, it's because she's very um, like the painting that uh, has been, of course, depicted uh, later on in the centuries about uh, Gudrid, uh, because we don't have the real image of Gudrid. We know that she was uh, very, very beautiful of striking appearance. And um, so um, the case uh, is that uh, Amy was uh, very like this uh, uh, painting. And also later on, I found out that even the book of Heather <laughs> as another uh, uh, girl that uh, is uh, very like her too, you know. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that, that that happened later on when we selected uh, Amy mm -hmm. Erin Johnson to do the uh, part of Goodread, and uh, she will appear in episode four. Meanwhile, uh, the three authors will speak of her, plus, uh, of course, uh, narrator. Uh, Gretchen, and um, so you will see uh, a real Goodread on the screen, 
that uh, give life, give life to the idea of uh, their, what they're working, what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and she um, unfortunately, yeah, we uh, she couldn't be here with us today either. And so uh, we'll definitely get that done and get this added in so that everyone could get an opportunity to hear from her as well uh, in her input. But uh, yeah, this is this is something that uh, has been fascinating, really, uh, to to find this, uh, you know, find out about this woman, as I mentioned earlier, and and then, you know, be able to now portray this in episode four. I, I, I honestly I cannot wait for it to come out on that's Thursday on the 26th. It's raining pretty hard outside. I don't know if you can hear that. But uh, on the Thursday, the 26th, for the premiere release of this on Amazon, um, I'm looking forward to it. I really am. Um, I Gretchen, I want to say something more. Okay, please. Oh, I was looking for the uh, painting. It appeared to be a, um, a uh, early 20th century painting, perhaps, or Victorian uh, painting that, that Luca had found. And Amy looks just like this uh beautiful imagery uh, of, of perhaps romanticized of of Gudrid. Um, I think that that beauty was remarked upon going back many years because uh, if you were beautiful it meant that you had a good heart, you you were you were a good person, you had done something good, uh, your parents had done something good. So there was a lot of a, a lot of uh, weight put upon. There it is. Yeah, mm -hmm. a lot of weight put upon uh, beauty. It, it it meant something. So uh, knowing that these sagas were written down a few hundred years later, uh, it was very important that she was a beautiful woman. And of course, that would of course her descendants would would therefore more than likely be very good looking too. Um, one thing I would like to say about the, the, the culture is that they were so proud of, of memorizing their stories and passing them down. And yes, things did get shifted a bit. They did change. But as on Andrea uh, had said, um, even about the the. the Zeno brothers, you know, of course, he was, that was all based off of letters, but there's so much, there's so many truths in the saga, if you step back like a, um, uh, a detective, like a police officer, uh, that's a beautiful cover mm -hmm. of, um, uh, of Gudrid, yes, very similar, mm -hmm. um, very typical, what we typically think of as, as a Norse, or mm -hmm. Danish or uh, Icelandic looking person. But um, uh, memorization was so important going back, you know, because of the, the lack of writing. Um, so I, I think there's there's got to be an awful lot of truths in these stories. Um, I, I think it's a mistake to, to view them as a work of fiction by a sloppy person you know our our ancestors going back uh, they, they weren't sloppy you know these people worked hard or or you you died you know you had to master your environment yourself and with a a, a bit of luck and and blessing uh get survive you know to have a family etc uh with mortality rates uh, being high etc and crossing the Atlantic was was no small thing, and not everybody made it. It's not certainly mm -hmm. none of us are here saying that the these uh, sea travelers were uh, on a bus schedule that mm -hmm. you could count on. That just isn't the case. Nope. Uh, and and so much of what they did had had a stylistic uh, overview, but everything was bespoke to the ship to the person. Everybody was making their own clothing. Um, they wore their wealth. Um, it, it was a very different world. Mm -hmm. a very different world. Yeah. And I'm sure, you know, Heather and Nancy have immersed themselves in this world. Nancy even has Icelandic horses. Is really? That, is she still with us? She's an Icelandic mm -hmm. dog. And an Icelandic dog. Oh, I just, I, I was 
privilege to see the the your interview with with these beautiful uh, yeah. horses, and they but you know very cheeky looking, very um, uh, the 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 your your boy uh, he he was quite cheeky. And uh, he wanted to be the star of the show. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, I think so. He was delightful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's quite an endeavor to get those horses from Iceland to to your home. That must That's have been a journey for it's them. It's not so hard. I have another one coming in a couple of weeks. Wow. They fly. What? Really? <laughs> still a plane full of horses. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. That's crazy. So she has four. Um, are you breeding them? Um, no, no, I just have them for pleasure riding. But uh, my friend who is an Icelandic woman who lives in Vermont, she uh, does some breeding also. And she does, she handles all the importing, so I don't have to deal with it. Wow. But she, uh, she has brought over about 100 horses in the last few years. Oh, my years. goodness. Yeah. Wow. So they're, they're getting. <laughs> I can't even imagine how much that would cost, but don't bother with that. I was just thinking that to myself. I was like, how much would that cost to fly a horse over? Oh my goodness. That is a labor, a labor of love, a labor. Yes, of love. absolutely. Wow. Yes. Yes. Well, I tell you, this has been an absolutely wonderful afternoon. Uh, just to the honor that I have uh, just to meet all of you um is the honor is mine for sure and and i'm sure that the folks that have been watching here today feel the same way um you all have such talent and the things that you've added to the story and to this tv series the templars tv series uh is fascinating i honestly i said this earlier but i cannot wait for episode number four to come out so that we can see it um i do have i don't know if um the, uh, there are some teaser trailers out there for it uh, right now um, that are that are out. Um, you can check those out on Luca's site. Those are available on your. Uh, are they available on your uh, web icon site or? Well, they're available on YouTube. Um, okay. Actually, um, everybody can see them. Uh, they're public. Uh, I don't know if you can send it on air or not but uh, yeah, I'll get it. Uh, what's it is that under the um let me look let me see if i can find that real quick here it's basically the trailer is the first three minutes of uh, the episode oh here it is there there it is jeff Okay, yeah, let me uh, jump over here, grab that real quick. Oh, there we go. Oh, there's, the, <laughs> I wanted to show this too real quick, but yeah, um, this was the, uh, this was the picture that I kind of threw together real quick while I get that video uh, oh, of yeah. the two side by side. Mm -hmm. That was, that was the stunning one for me to be able to see it like yeah. that for sure. Um, oh, there we go. All right, so uh, let me see if I can bring this up here. Whoops. Uh oh. Uh, let me, sorry, put that over here. Sorry about that little technical issue there. And we'll, we're going to play this real quick so we can all, uh, all watch this real fast here. There's no voice. <laughs> Actually, there is no voice at all, uh, Jeff. What's that? There is no speaker. There is a speaker oh, in this image. Sure. Okay, yeah, I'm not. I don't so know. it's uh, just out of the. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly why we're yeah, not. Yeah, better, better not to hear it, uh, but you can find. Uh, yeah. On you, oh, everybody can find it on yeah. YouTube. It's on and, YouTube. Uh, yeah, it's easy to find. And, Sorry uh, about that. Eventually, Jeff could. Uh, just uh, write it down on the mm -hmm. uh, actually uh, uh let's do that i can put that and link that in the uh in yeah the because that was um, totally mute there i've got it linked now in the chat so you can all see it there sorry about that little technical issue with that 
but uh, again, I, uh, Luca, I have to thank you so much for gathering these wonderful people together and putting together the Templar series up to this point. Can't wait to see four and five coming out. What's the, uh, what was the name of number five when it's, uh, the sword and the circle the sword and the circle. Fantastic. And that's going to be the, uh, the end of this one for five is the, is the end of yes, it? Yes. Uh, for okay. season one. Yeah. Okay, for oh, for just season one. Ah, so there's going to be a season two. Well, very <laughs> we don't know. It depends uh, if investors want to invest on it. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Well, folks, I tell you what, this has been a fascinating uh, afternoon. And uh, Tanya, thank you so much. Gretchen, as always, thank you very much for being here. Nancy on the phone, Heather. Uh, Paulo and uh, Luca and also Andrea who left and then we really hope that we can uh, we'll have to wait till episode number four comes out to see uh, to see and and uh, hear from Margaret um, mm -hmm. uh, on her portion of it unfortunately like I said she couldn't be here with us today but uh, this has been a very fascinating afternoon I can't thank you enough uh, for using this platform to announce this uh, premiere of episode number four uh, and again, folks, that's coming out on Thursday. Uh, it's going to be available. I've watched the first three. You're not going to want to miss this. If you truly care about uh, or have an interest in the Templars and also in this portion of the story, with good or the fair, you really need to check these out. Very, very well done by all of you. And I thank you so much for being on the show here with us today. Thank you. Thank you, thank Jeff. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to meet you. All right. Thank you to everyone watching. Thank you. So we're gonna we're going to uh, be continuing as we go along with Luca. We're gonna stay in touch with him, and as we have more developments, we will bring them to you as quickly as possible. So thanks again for everybody being here with us today. And folks, hang out just a minute after I close this up, and uh, we'll talk just briefly. But uh, thank you all for being with us here today, and uh, you have a great rest of your weekend. And that's it from the Curse of Oak Island and Beyond live stream and Jay Free Nine Hundred Six. Thank you. <laughs>